A pleasure now to uh, introduce our next presenter, Syed Mustafa Ali, from the School of Computing and Communications at the Open University. Um, white crisis and as existential risk or the entangled apocalypticism of artificial intelligence. <coughs> Okay, um, so thanks first of all to Sensam for the kind invitation um, and to everybody who turned up uh, today. Great weather, but it's freezing cold. Um, I'm going to try to do something uh, slightly different um, with this talk. Um, and let, let's see how it goes. Um, step through. This, is, this is essentially a sketch of, of the talk, just so there's you know, a road map for where hopefully I'll be taking us over the next 20 minutes. <clears throat> okay, so, in a series of works exploring the mobilization of apocalyptic themes and ideas drawn from the Western religious, more specifically and significantly Judeo-Christian tradition in contemporary discourses addressing the alleged convergence of so-called GRIN, that is genetics, robotics, IT, and nanotechnology technologies in a singularity phenomenon. Robert Garassi has drawn attention to various important entanglements of science, technology, and religion, which need to be engaged when considering the rhetoric and reality of contemporary concerns about existential risk. Notwithstanding the importance of such explorations, I want to suggest that they are marked by certain shortcomings which become apparent when one shifts interrogating the phenomenon of apocalyptic AI from the perspective of religious studies to the perspective of critical religion studies, with the latter underpinned by the understanding that race and religion are thoroughly entangled, perhaps starting with a shared point of origin in modernity or in the colonial encounter, such that religion and race is not just another token of the type religion and something, not just one approach to the study of religion among many, rather that every study of religion and or race, I would suggest, would need to be a study of religion and race. Building on earlier work exploring reflexive relations between race and information, information and orientalism, and more recent work exploring race, more specifically whiteness, and as transhumanism, in connection with the phenomenon of white crisis, and the entanglement of various strands of apocalypticism in information society discourse, in what follows, I propose to explore the theme of existential risk associated with apocalyptic AI and other contingently related existential threats in relation to the phenomenon of white crisis which I suggest should be understood as a modern racial phenomenon with pre-modern religious origins. More specifically, I want to explore the possibility that apocalyptic AI and the attendant discourse of existential risk is a strategy, albeit possibly one that is merely rhetorical, for maintaining white hegemony under mounting non-white contestation or challenge. I further suggest that this claim can be shown to be supported by the disclosure of continuity through change in the long durée entanglement of race and religion associated with the establishment, maintenance, expansion and refinement of the modern colonial world system if and when such changes are understood as iterations in what might be described as a programmatic trajectory of domination the continuity or historical essence of which might be framed as algorithmic racism. In order to motivate my argument, I need to begin by setting out my understanding of three terms, the world, whiteness, and white crisis. By the world, I mean the world system which emerged in the long durée of the 16th century, following the so-called Colombian voyages of discovery to the New World commencing in 1492, a global hierarchical system whose dominant core lies in the West and whose subaltern periphery is constituted by the rest. Although the modern world system is often characterized as capitalist in orientation, I suggest that this framing is at best incomplete 
and at worst, a mischaracterization insofar as it obscures what decolonial scholar Walter Mignolo refers to as the dark underside of modernity. That is, the fact that it was forged through violence as an imperial colonial undertaking with religious come racial foundations, and that the structuring logics, ontological, epistemological, cultural, political, economic, etc., associated with this project, what is referred to as coloniality, persist in the post-colonial era, notwithstanding the formal end of colonialism with the national independence movements of the 1960s. Yet while centering 1492 and race in relation to the formation of the world system, where race should be understood as involving processes of exclusion, taxonomization, and naturalization, it is necessary to emphasize the contribution of antecedent historical phenomena that informed this enterprise and whose structuring logics were embedded in the constitution of this system. In this connection, the anti-Islamic or anti-Islamicate foundation of the Crusades commencing in 1095 stands out as of perhaps decisive significance vis-a-vis -vis its role in Christian polity formation, that is, the emergence of Christendom, come Europe, come the West, and as providing a template for later imperial colonial ventures. In addition, recent scholarship in crit critical medieval studies suggests that racialization processes were operative in the European Middle Ages, while others have attempted to make the case for the presence of a proto-racism in ancient Greece and Rome, both of which point to the need to think beyond the historical geographical horizon of 16th century Atlantic centrism when thinking about the entanglement of race and religion. Regarding the matter of whiteness, here I draw upon the sociological account of the phenomenon presented by sociologist Steve Garner, amended by way of certain insights drawn from the work of human geographer Alistair Bonnet. According to Garner, use of the term, category, concept, white, to describe people has 16th century New World origins, functioning in that context as merely one of a range of labels and not the one most frequently used. On his view, religion, more specifically terms such as Christian and heathen, nation, social class, were all deployed more than color. Bonnet presents a slightly different view, referring to the arising of a, tri of a triple conflation, white equals European equals Christian, that imparted moral, cultural, and territorial content to whiteness, thereby pointing to the entangled nexus of race and religion in the colonial setting. Furthermore, and crucially, he insists that modern European white identity is historically unique on account of its naturalization and centralization of whiteness. Broadly concurring with Bonnet, yet drawing on what was stated earlier regarding the history of Western polity formation, I want to suggest that the triple conflation white equals Christian equals European should be complemented with an understanding that these terms have also been deployed chronologically as a sequence of master signifiers, viz. Christian, thereafter European, thereafter white, and latterly Western. What remains somewhat obscured here is a long legacy of conflation of the aforementioned terms with the category of the human, which I suggest becomes highly significant when attempting to think through the implications of transhuman and posthuman shifts in relation to apocalyptic AI. Yet whiteness is clearly not a merely historic phenomenon. Adopting a somewhat structuralist position, Ghana maintains that whiteness exists only in relation to what it is not, that it should be understood processually in dynamic relational tension to other racialized identities. Furthermore, whiteness is a persistent phenomenon, continually reinventing itself and functioning both as tacit, invisible background standard and sociopolitical structural manifestation or globally systemic white supremacy. Finally, by white crisis, I refer to a situation in which a hegemonic whiteness is subjected to increasing challenge or contestation by the non-white other 
engendering a heightened sense of anxiety and threat amongst those raced as white expressed through various discursive formulations and prompting a variety of responses. According to Bonnet, whiteness and the West are both projects with an inbuilt tendency to crisis. From the early years of the last century, through the mid-century and into the present day, we have been told that the West is doomed. Commenting on the emergence of white crisis literature in late 19th, early 20th century Britain, Bonnet maintains that the period when the white race was represented as undergoing a grave crisis was also the period when white supremacism was most fully and boldly incorporated within public discourse. Crucially, according to Bonnet, this relationship is unsurprising, for the one is the flip side of the other. In other words, crisis and supremacy come together. In drawing attention to what appears to be a recurrent phenomenon, I want to suggest that it might be useful to think about white crisis in terms of its providing a lens or frame through which to see and thereby disclose race as Janus-faced, informing both pre-modern manifestations of Western Christian apocalypticism in the medieval period and contemporary secular apocalypticism, more specifically the phenomenon of existential risk entangled with apocalyptic AI. By apocalypticism, I refer to the originally religious belief that there will be an apocalypse, a term which originally referred to a revelation of God's will, but which now tends to refer to the belief that the world will come to an end very soon, even within one's own lifetime. Significantly, this belief is usually accompanied by the idea that civilization will soon come to a tumultuous end due to some sort of catastrophic global event, such as might be associated with nuclear war, biotechnology, climate change, and or AI. In this connection, I suggest that we think about the ending of the world in relation to my earlier discussion of the world, that is, the modern colonial world system of global white supremacy, notwithstanding the ways in which existential risks are presented in mainstream discourse on the subject. Yet if there is a parallel between apocalypticism and white crisis, what of the latter's flip side, viz. white supremacy? Here I want to draw attention to the correlation of apocalypticism with its opposite, millenarianism and or millennialism. That is, the expectation that while the end of the world is near, a new earthly paradise is at hand, and suggests that while presented as a potential existential risk, AI and related technologies are simultaneously framed in millennialist terms as ushering in a fourth industrial revolution, promising super intelligence and super abundance. While Gerasi has usefully explored pre-modern religious experiences of alienation and threat in terms of their contingent relation to early Jewish and Christian apocalypticism and related strands of thought such as Christian millennialism and millenarianism and the persistence of these concerns in apocalyptic AI, I want to suggest that his exploration is problematic on at least two counts. First, while rightly drawing attention to the positing of a mind-body dualism in the context of setting out a series of binary oppositions underpinning the apocalyptic AI worldview, Gerasi's near non-engagement with race and its entanglement with religion arguably results in tacit invocation of a Eurocentrically universal de-raced or raceless conceptualization of the purified body thereby forestalling disclosure of the racial underpinnings of apocalyptic AI as a modern colonial phenomenon. In this connection, I should like to briefly draw attention to the important work of Dylan Mahendran from 2011, who has explored mind-body dualism in terms of a modern colonial opposition of race as embodied and computation as rational, the former correlated with subhumanity, the latter with humanity, based on a decolonial perspective, wherein considerations of body politics and geopolitics of knowledge, that is, who gets to construct knowledge from where in the modern colonial world system 
and according to what frameworks are foregrounded. Adopting a decolonial perspective readily discloses the racialized nature of apocalyptic AI, since notwithstanding the international nature of its movements and institutions, and granted the need to take seriously the hybrid nature of endeavors involving the contributions of various ethnicities, genders, and nationalities, it is empirically demonstrable on demographic grounds, both quantitative and qualitative, that the apocalyptic AI community is hegemonically white, male, and Western, that is, Euro-American. Furthermore, it is a project whose trajectory is arguably traceable genealogically to a specific historical and geographical experience, that of Western Judeo-Christianity and the Euro European Enlightenment as informed by various rationalistic, but also esoteric or occult currents. On this basis, and in terms of its entanglement with race, I want to suggest that apocalyptic AI should be identified and understood as a Eurocentric slash West-centric modern colonial phenomenon. Secondly, Gerasi's non-engagement with the long durée role of the Islamicate other in Western identity formation, that is, the formation of Christendom, come Europe, come the West, against the backdrop of the perceived or constructed existential threat posed by the Islamicate polity, which results in a bracketing, an occlusion, a silencing, an erasure that has implications for how to think about the significance of historical transformations within Western apocalypticism, including its more recent incarnation as apocalyptic AI. For example, while Gerasi cites David Noble's reference to the role of technology in the war against the Antichrist, and the Antichrist is an apocalyptic figure within Christian tradition, the Antichrist remains unidentified in Gerasi's oeuvre. This omission is somewhat puzzling, given that Noble refers explicitly to Cistercian monk Joachim of Fiore, who was born in the 12th century, uh, and his apocalyptic and millenarian... Joachim of Fiore and his apocalyptic and millenarian identification of Saladin or Salahuddin as an, an antichrist figure, a view informed by Fiore's embrace of a crusader worldview, as well as to later identifications of the antichrist, for example, by the Protestant reformer Martin Luther with the Catholic papacy. Wakimai apocalypticism and millennialism and its entanglement with anti-Islamic crusading takes on added significance once it is appreciated that Christopher Columbus, who launched the so-called New World Voyages of Discovery, actually conquest, thereby ushering in the modern colonial racial world system, held Wakamite views, styling himself as a messianic figure, committed to liberating Jerusalem from the infidels. In short, there is an entanglement of race, religion, war, and the apocalyptic around the figure of Joachim of Fiore. Gerasi's non-engagement with Fiore is further significant insofar as the latter has been identified by David Noble, Eric Davis, John Gray, and others as a figure of abiding importance in the genealogy of Western apocalypticism, including apocalyptic AI. On the basis of his projection of the Christian trinity onto the stage of history via his so-called theory of the three ages, the last of which, the age of the sun, points to a spiritual and in contemporary apocalyptic AI terms, perhaps informational mode of existence. As an example of the latter, Davis points to futurist Alvin Toffler's notion of the third wave. However, Joachimite theory arguably manifests in more recent information-centric worldviews, including both those of the non-apocalyptic variety, such as Luci Luciano Floridi's Fourth Revolution, and those of an explicitly apocalyptic AI orientation, such as Max Tegmark's recent Life 3.0 proposal. Returning to the entanglement of race, religion, war, and the apocalyptic, if crusader anti-Islamism indeed characterizes the contingent yet historically sedimented long durée dispositional background, structuring logic, ontological, epistemological, etc., informing Western perceptions of Islam and Muslims, 
including those operative within the horizon of the post-Christian West, and if this background includes apocalyptic perceptions, constructions of Islam, wherein the latter is understood as a heresy, the Prophet Muhammad seen on occasion as a herald or manifestation of Antichrist, and Muslims, Saracens, Moors, Turks, etc., as the hordes of the Antichrist, and a perennial threatening enemy other, what might this mean in terms of the entanglement of race, religion and war in the contemporary moment of white crisis, arguably generating a variety of apocalyptic responses from whiteness, including conservative reactionary alt-right populism, nativism, fascism, with its attendant Islamophobia, but possibly also apocalyptic AI in the form of transformative, proactive, trans or post-humanism. While Garassi maintains that military funding played no role in the development of apocalyptic AI. In an earlier work, and I'm citing his different works here, he points to Cold War anxieties about nuclear pr proliferation informing the worldview of apocalyptic AI proponents. Yet I argue that the facts are somewhat more overdetermined than Gerasi suggests, in that there is a contextual dark underside of coloniality that needs to be considered in relation to such late modern technological developments ostensibly triggered by Cold War concerns, not to mention the relatively transitory nature of Soviet communism as an orientalized other emerging within Europe when compared to the long durée oriental other represented by the Islamicate both preceding and succeeding the Red Menace. <coughs> Furthermore and again that these developments are entangled with the modern phenomenon of white crisis, that is, perceived threat posed by the non-white other, which has a pre-modern precursor in theopolitical anxieties, perceived threat posed primarily by the Islamicate other. Now, in stating the above, I want to differentiate my position from the clash thesis as articulated by contemporary neo-medievalists such as Orientalist Bernard Lewis and international relations theorist Samuel Huntington. Numerous attempts have been made to debunk this thesis, including those due to Edward Said and more recently John Tolan and others, all of which point to a complex, long durée history of interaction and engagement between Western Christian and Muslim polities that has taken various forms, some of them hostile and others marked by more conciliatory, if not convivial, relations. While the clash thesis in crude, trans-historical form pointing to a metaphysical condition, what some have referred to as a cosmic war, is a naturalizing, depoliticizing position founded on an erasure of historical realities in pursuit of a political agenda. Drawing on the seminal work of Norman Daniel, Thomas Masnach, Najera Cardinal, Megret, and others, I want to suggest that the thesis reinterpreted as shorthand for a contingent yet historically sedimented long durée dispositional bias manifesting structurally or systemically is in fact well founded and that anti-Islamism as an ontological background horizon remains operative periodically erupting under certain conditions for example as 19th century Orientalism and contemporary Islamophobia crucially as Arshin Adil Muradam has importantly argued this clash is arguably a competition over history and temporal sequences of humanity, an issue of fundamental relevance to apocalyptic AI in terms of its fundamentally futurist orientation. <coughs> Returning to the issue of white crisis and its entanglement with apocalypticism and anti-Islamism, Cardinal and Megret point out that war with Islam was motivated by salvation of souls and millenarian Christian-centric universalism. In this connection, it is interesting to note that according to Michael Zimmerman, post-humanist discourse, including Ray Kurzweil's, represents, at least in some respects, the Western salvation narrative, a view with which Gerasi concurs, or at least I think you concur with this view. Crucially, Cardinal and Megret maintain that salvation in its political form has its origins in medieval crusading as an activity with religious institutional basis. Quote, the church's perception of the wretchedness of an other 
a necessarily monological interpretation originating in the Holy See's own singular worldview, established salvation as one of the modes of operation of the Church's intersocietal normative technologies. In other words, salvation from the other's demonical madness was the Church's normative mode of operation in its encounter with this other who was irreducible to its own normative worldview. Through its ideological power over Catholics, the sacerdotal power arrogated for itself a universalist vision of truth and knowledge supported by the disciplinary power of salvation to enforce this monistic view of the world against those who did not partake in it." End quote. In this connection, one might question concerning the secularized sacerdotal power of those scientists, philosophers, futurists, and other proponents of apocalyptic AI, advancing what is arguably a rhetorical disciplinary narrative of salvation, a narrative overwhelmingly shaped by white saviors, self-tasked with finding solutions to the apocalyptic problem of existential risk, a problem of, I would suggest, their own making. Now, granted the above entanglements of race, religion, war, and the apocalyptic or millennial, how can or should sense be made of such entanglements with the phenomenon of apocalyptic AI? In this connection, I suggest recourse is made to the idea of algorithmic racism, which is an idea I'm developing in my work. Briefly, algorithmic racism is a methodological framework for, cons for conceptualizing the relationship between processes of racial formation or racialization within Western historical experience in relation to its various others. Although algorithmic racism can be understood as referring to algorithms as sites for embedding and means for expressing racial bias, it should be understood here as invoking the figure of the algorithm as a metaphor for thinking coherently about the relationship between different discursive formations, religious, philosophical, scientific, cultural, etc., as races paradigmatically articulated at different periods within the history of colonial modernity. In fact, such transformations should be seen as constituting re-articulations, or rather re-iterations, if we use the algorithmic metaphor, of the difference between the European, the white, the Western, and the non-European, the non-white, the non-Western, along what decolonial scholars have referred to as the line of the human. While it is common among proponents of apocalyptic AI, more specifically transhumanists and technological posthumanists, to historically and geographically frame the category of the human with reference to European re Renaissance and Enlightenment thought, I suggest that this move tends to obscure the origins of the human as a Eurocentric religious racial category forged in antagonistic relation to the non-European other as the subhuman during the long durée of the 16th century, if not earlier. Against this backdrop, I want to argue that concerns about the existential risk posed by apocalyptic AI should be understood as entangled with a shift from the distinction between subhuman non-human, sorry, non-European, non-white, and human, European, white. So a shift from that to the distinction between human, non-European, non-white, and transhuman, European, white. Such shift being intended to maintain the relational and hierarchical binary between the European and non-European, and prompted at least partly by certain kinds of critical and decolonial posthumanist contestation of Eurocentric conceptions of the human. Furthermore, that such a shift is occurring against the broader background or horizon of a resurfacing of the phenomenon of white crisis. I want to suggest that it is the very apocalyptic nature of the phenomenon of white crisis, that is, perceived threat to white supremacy under mounting contestation from the non-white other that contributes to engendering what I refer to as the algorithmic transformation of humanism into technological post-humanism via transhumanism as an iterative shift within the historically sedimented ontologic of Eurocentric racialization. By framing the issue in terms of contribution rather than causation, I recognize that the transhumanist 
post-humanist project is over-determined in terms of its historical motivations and causes. I further suggest that such techno-millennialist currents uh, feed into the emerging technology of race at the onset of colonial modernity, which commenced with the Colombian voyages in 1492. In short, insofar as ideas of levering technology to achieve utopian and or apocalyptic purposes have a long history, I am not suggesting that the transhumanist project is driven solely by a post-racial crisis of whiteness. Rather, I argue that under contemporary conditions of white crisis, the transhumanist project gains a sense of urgency as a techno-scientific resolution or fix to such an anxiety-ridden state of affairs, and that it is decolonially prudent to think about the discourse of existential threat in this way. To reiterate, humanism, transhumanism, and posthumanism should be understood as iterations within, within the structural, that is, relational logic of algorithmic racism. An apocalyptic AI in both its transitional form, transhumanism, and its final form, posthumanism, should be understood in relation to the project of maintaining structurally asymmetric power relations between the formerly human, white, western, male, etc., and its subaltern other, even as the latter contests the Eurocentric terrain of the human. Perhaps most provocatively, I suggest that this shift in the line of the human and its entanglement with white crisis and as existential risk should be understood in terms of race war and that this decolonial reading of the phenomenon holds true irrespective of whether apocalyptic AI is framed in a liberal, democratic, techno-progressive register or in more elitist, libertarian terms. I further suggest that my position should not be seen as belonging to the genre of conspiracy theory, notwithstanding the entanglement of apocalyptic AI with such discourse. And by way of conclusion, in closing, I should like to offer some brief reflections on the question of the rhetorical versus existential nature posed by the existential risk of apocalyptic AI. For some, such as critical theorist and rhetorician Dale Carrico, apocalyptic AI is a distractor from the real challenges afforded by futurist technologies, a position shared by, shared by Luciano Floridi in the latter's criticism of what he refers to as the proponents of AI theism. While sympathetic to their arguments, viz. that apocalyptic AI is a distraction, their common failure to correctly identify the modern colonial world system as racial in orientation, and thereby to foreground racial concerns, forecloses the possibility of analyzing the issue in terms of algorithmic racism. In this connection, and summarizing the argument I have made here, here and elsewhere, I want to suggest that trans slash posthumanism can, and from a critical race theoretical and or decolonial perspective, should be viewed as a response to the phenomenon of white crisis, one that is techno-scientific and occurs in parallel with, albeit somewhat obscured by, the more overt phenomenon of conservative white backlash. On this view, apocalyptic AI should at least be seen as a rhetorical strategy for maintaining hegemony under contestation, and that, and that the lens through which to think about the possibility or impossibility, plausibility or implausibility of this phenomenon is political, more specifically racial, religious, political economy, and not philosophical, theological or scientific notwithstanding the entanglement of these other ways of viewing the issue. Further, that the real threat might be less one of apocalyptic AI and more one of apocalyptic IA, that is, intelligence augmentation, in the sense of deployment of so-called smart technologies in pursuit of a more subtle and diffuse cyborgian slash transhumanist agenda than the one presented by techno-evangelical extropians, singularitarians, etc. But that entangled apocalyptic narrative is something that will have to be taken up elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. David. Start with David. 
Uh, okay, yeah. Um, I, could you maybe go back, like, way back to the beginning where you're talking about your, your three pillars of colonialism stuff? Because mm -hmm. I found that a little challenging, I think. Yeah, so you're kind of setting it up as this kind of 1492 event and this kind of colonialism, this white expansion, the slavery and all this kind of stuff, right? But obviously that's, there were many colon colonialisms prior to that, right? That were not white, that were based on, you know, expansion of Islam or whatever, it was a massive colonial system based on slavery that no doubt killed lots of indigenous peoples, right? Romans the same, probably the Zulus, the Mongols and so on and so forth, right? So yeah. I find it super problematic that you talk about colonialism as if it's a single thing that's white, right? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if you framed it in terms of multiple colonialisms that are some are white, some are black, some are whatever, right? Some are Christian, non-Christian, pagan, whatever, then maybe you need to look for separate reasons that are kind of trying to explain why this particular colonialism that happened to be white kind of contingently, you know, ended up, you know, having these kind of millennial stuff linked to technology. Maybe you need to tell a story about, you know, the lack of coal in North Africa and why we need a new Coleman, you know, engine which led to steam power in that particular part of the world rather than, you know, you see what I'm trying to say, right? Sure, sure. It needs a slightly more rich historical notion of colonialism and then look for contingent facts about why a particular one is linked in the way in which you talk about, and I accept a lot of what you said about entanglement, but just not the historical framing of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this is a pretty much a standard response to anyone who articulates uh, the world system in terms of uh, European colonialism. Um, I will concede that there were prior colonizations uh, that historically occurred, even that there were prior colonialisms uh, that took place. You've mentioned quite rightly uh, Islamic expansion into Africa, into uh, South Asia, etc., uh, even into Europe, you know, siege of Vienna, which went on for a long time. Um, and then there's the, Ro the Romans and you know, various other uh, historical groups have engaged in colonization and or colonialism projects. But there's something quite specific about the European experience of colonialism. And that is that it actually gives rise to a world system. And it's the world system that we happen to live in right now. We don't happen to live in the Islamicate colonial world system. We happen to live in a European colonial world system. And it's also unique insofar as it uh, effectively knitted up the world geographically. Um, so if we, it, if we think about 1492 and its significance, it is really the onset of tying up um, Europe, i.e. the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal. Um, I mean, 1492, two important events happen at the same time. You've got the fall of Granada, um, so that's the fall of Moorish or Mayid power in the Iberian Peninsula. No, no, 1492. It's ex exactly that same year that these two events take place. Uh, the, the keys to Granada are actually handed over to uh, Ferdinand and Is Isabella. Um, that's at the same time that the, the, the um, so-called voyages of discovery, actually voyages of conquest, uh, and they're actually apocalyptic voyages because let's, you know, the, the, the kind of glossed narrative we have about Columbus is that, you know, he's, he's trying to find India, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, yeah, that's, that's true. But um, why did he want to find India? Uh, if you read around um, the, the various uh, narratives, uh, you find out that his singular project, um, which he includes in his will, is that Jerusalem must be liberated from the infidel. It must be taken back. And the, the reason I flagged up the figure of uh, Joachim of Fiore is that uh, Columbus self-identifies as a messiah in the Joachimite tradition. He sees himself as uh, historically predestined to free the world from the yoke of the infidel. So the apocalyptic Christian strand of the project is there at the outset. Now, just to get back to the point about what distinguishes European or Eurocentric colonialism from other uh, historical instances of uh, colonialism or colonization, is that 
Apart from the Iberian Peninsula, you know, we, we then forge our first link, and our first link is to the so-called New World, the Americas, if you like. Um, once the triangle trade is established, that's the, effectively the slave trade, we have to then factor in Africa as a source of slaves. And once... But the that's true in Islam too, right? No, it's not true at all. There, there is no triangle trade in Islam. There is no triangle trade. No, there's a trade within, within uh, from Africa and going up north and back. But, 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 it, but it, it never created uh, a system which had... Um, I mean, at, at the time when the, when the Muslims were expanding into different parts of the world, you had a pluralistic world system. Um, I mean, Janet Abu Lohud has talked about this in, I think, the 13th or 14th century, that there was actually a globalization before globalization. And she, she, she refers to before European hegemony. And I think what she's pointing to there is significant in the sense that what we see with the emergence of um, the, the new world system is not just the fact that uh, a particular group of people are responsible for, if you like, constructing a network, but that that network expands outwards to literally encompass the entirety of the globe. Well, so at that time, obviously, that's a very Eurocentric telling of the story, completely ignoring China and Russia, for example. Not, not, not at all, because uh, if you think about modernity as a project that has its roots in the long durée of the 16th century, it feeds into the Industrial Revolution. It feeds into the exporting of philosophies that come out of that European experience. So I'm thinking here Marxism. You think about the transplanting of Marxism into the Russian context. You think about the movement of Marxism into the Chinese context. These are discourses that originate in Europe and yet ripple outwards. And they're all entangled with industrial developments, which themselves are entangled with prior developments to do with the slave trade. I mean, we don't find an industrial revolution in Islamic history. We don't find the erasure of indigenous knowledges in Islamic history. We just don't find that. The, the, the Mughals were in India for, what, a thousand years, perhaps? Uh, we, didn't, we don't see the erasure that we see in the Americas of the codices of Mayan, Aztec, and, and Inca peoples. We don't see that erasure. The Puranas, the Vedas, these, these traditions are intact. I think the Muslims were, not the Muslims, sorry, the Mongols were initially not that Islamic anyway. They were kind of pagan, right? And then they were actually more no, I'm about the Mughals. Yeah, the, the Mughals, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Mughals were, were Mongols originally, right? Sure. Yeah, and then they've kind of Islamified over time through their expansion, right? So uh, anyway, we're probably not going to agree about this, so maybe we should have another question here. Um, we're getting tight on time, so if you could keep responses. It's, it's sure. I just wanted to add that 1492 is also the year in which the Jews are expelled from Spain. And so just to kind of add to this, you know, where you're coming from there in terms of the significance yeah, yeah, yeah. of that period. Um, Beth, I've got one question down here. Michael, sorry, we're going to be out of time. I'm just... I just want to say thank you so much for that talk. I thought it was really good and um, really refreshing to hear those kind of ideas put forward because I haven't really heard that before. And I really like this slide with the covers of Wired because I think unless you are a white guy, generally you, you, it's very obvious how many of these covers do not have anybody other than uh, influential white guys on the cover. And I think there have been more monkeys on the front of Wired than there have women or something like that. Anyway... Um, <laughs> There is some statistic if you look it up. Uh, but my question, well, I mean, uh, there's loads of things I wanted to talk to you about, but I won't now. But I just wanted to ask if it's um, up online anywhere, what you just read out, or if there's any way I can read it, because it's quite dense, and I wanted to read it again. Okay, so um, just a quick response to that. So, n first of all, apologies for the length. I thought that this was 20 minutes, but it looks like it was more than 20 minutes, so I apologize for that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the, the paper I actually read... Um, was about seven pages. The full paper is 33 pages, and the rest of it's just end notes. It's trying to substantiate through very careful uh, exegesis of uh, Robert Grassi's works and, and, <laughs> and uh, other people attempting to um, flesh out the argument and substantiate it. Uh, I, I do hope to publish this uh, at some point, um, but if, if we talk, I can you know, give you my details or, or, or whatever. 
Uh, just a reasonably quick question. So you, you have lots of great pictures of people from Future of Life, Future of Humanities, uh, Centre for Studies and Existential Risk. No one from, not many people from CFI. But I'm just curious how much you, you've actually spoken with the people there. Have you engaged with them? Because you conflated at a few points existential risk and transhumanism, specifically in relation to the array of faces you were talking about there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And actually... Not all the people involved with those organisations and cards on the table, I'm also part of CFI, they aren't all transhumanists, or if they are, they're in different degrees, they have different definitions of existential risk, mm -hmm. their, their debates and discourses do vary quite a lot, so I'm curious, you sort of lump them all together in a way mm -hmm. that, yes, comes from the websites and presentation of faces who do, I admit, generally look quite similar, but I'm just wondering how much you've actually unpacked what they're talking mm -hmm. about when it comes to existential risk? Okay, so that's a, a completely fair observation. Um, what I've tried to do here, um, whether that move that I attempted was legitimate or otherwise, was use existential risk as um, essentially a placeholder for apocalyptic AI, given the theme of the conference. So I'm, I'm essentially just collapsing the two terms. I accept completely the existential risk is broader than apocalyptic AI. I completely concede that there may be people who are committed to taking existential risks seriously, who are not transhumanists or posthumanists, etc. But my, uh, what I was trying to do here was to bring into conversation uh, the apocalyptic, given the theme of the conference, um, apocalyptic AI as one manifestation of existential threat, and the idea of existential threat playing on the, the notion of threat and its entanglement with the idea of crisis in white crisis. So it, it's really a, it was an attempt to um, consider a possible entanglement, whether it's one I'm entangling or one that's already entangled. I mean, we can debate that, presumably. Uh, but I, I, I concede your point. All right. Uh, Michael, is your question very short? Yeah, very All right, let's go. First off, thank you for your paper. I really, really appreciate um, what you shared. I'll try and make this as short as possible. I'm thinking about Willie Jennings and what he's written. Have you come across Willie Jennings? Deal over. Basically what he says uh, in a paper that relates to a larger book is he says the problem with a translated text means that you don't have to learn the language of the original text. And he applies that to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're talking about, I think you're, you're sort of picking up on the way in which a translated text or texts sort of are reified and reinterpreted in a very colonial sense. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the, an actual look at the original Judeo-Christian scriptures are, you know, the original language are tied to a, a, a culture a group of people mm -hmm. that are not Western and look at the world in a particular way and conceive of the apocalypse in a particular way. And I'm happy to talk about that at length and would love to because I kind of wrote down all the points on, on sort of how it challenges that sort of European reification. But I just would, wanted to throw that out there to hear what you thought. Okay, r really quickly on that. Um, so, um, when I read uh, Robert Garassi's papers and part of his book, not all of his book, but part of his book, um, I mean, I, I, I like the argument, um, but I'm, I'm, and hopefully this speaks to what the question you're asking. I'm not talking to that argument. I'm talking to the Judeo-Christian within a, a specific geographical historical context. I'm not... I mean, if, if, if I, you can correct me because you're here. If, 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 I, if I get this wrong, uh, if, if I get this right, if I get this wrong, if I get this right, um, in the papers I've read, Robert Karassi is going back to those early texts, or at least exegesis of those early texts, and looking there, and then looking here, and then seeing maybe structural analogies, isomorphisms, etc. And that's a, that's a legitimate project. But if I can just quickly jump to this, what I mean by the occluded term is 
the occluded term for me is looking at a very specific historical geographical experience. And that is what we might call Western Christendom, come Europe, come the West. I, I'm not looking at ancient Judea, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's irrelevant, and I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite open to the possibility that we could have a completely different conversation if we were to go there. But I'm not going there. I'm going to a period where I think race is a religiously grounded but religiously superseded articulation of power is operative. And that's why I'm hoping my argument is not understood to be trans-historical. I'm not saying it's in the nature of the, 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 the cosmology of, of you know, the world in which we live that race is there. I, I'm not saying that. This is not a trans-historical argument. It's a sedimented historical argument. In other words, race has an origin in time. And that should be a cause for celebration because it means that it's contingent. It's not necessary. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mustafa, thank you so much. That's very, very interesting. <laughs>